So we want to make sure that when we are designing products, we keep in mind that we need to think about interaction design and focus on our goal-directed design. So remember, interaction design is what? Who remembers? My subtle hint isn't good enough? Right, it involves the planning of product behavior and form that supports and facilitates human behaviors. And so if we look specifically at goal-directed design, it's behavior-directed design. How are users going to use this? In order to understand that, we have to understand our user goals. So, how do we recognize our user goals? Well, we have a lot of different types of goals, right? So we have personal goals, right? These are simple goals, goals that we all tend to have, right? So I want to be efficient and fast with my work. I want to do a good job. I want to look competent, right? But there are also employer goals. Let's take a look at an example. Here's an accounting clerk. So we have an accounting clerk, the employee's goals, I want to be competent, I want to stay engaged, I don't want to be bored, especially if it's repetitive, I want to get things done, I want to enjoy my job, I don't want to be stressed out. The employer's goals, efficient processing of invoices. Right, they're paying their clerk. They want it fast. They want it, uh, they want it efficient. They want it accurate. What do you think will happen if you only focus on the employer goal? It was usually the person who's paying you, if it's a custom product. Then you're not satisfying the employee's goals. And that can be problematic. If you have something where it's difficult for the employee to be engaged, do you think that's going to affect their efficiency? Yes, it is. So it's really important to keep those things that, uh, in mind. So if you only design to achieve what the business wants, you're probably going to fail. You can have a product that is technologically superior, but it can still be a failure if it doesn't meet the user's goals. Remember we talked about the iPod? And we compared the iPod to the other MP3 players? A lot of people will say the other MP3 players technologically were superior. Who won? The iPod. Very important to remember. Now, one thing that people sometimes get mixed up with is looking at tasks versus goals. Because a lot of times, even when you talk to users, when you ask them what their goals are, do you think they tell you what their goals are? Not usually. They actually will tell you the tasks. But it's really important. If you want to design better products, you need to focus on the goals. What is a goal? An expectation of an end condition. But they are tightly interwoven with tasks. Why? Because tasks are the intermediate steps that help you reach the goals. People are very easily confused by these. Let me give you an example. Oh, by the way, I have to say this every semester. This is not a political statement. This is the example from your book. OK, let's look at the military. What is the goal of the military? To keep peace. That's why I'm saying it's not a political statement. This is an example from your, from your book. I heard that groan. So the goal is to keep peace. In order to keep peace, what is a task they may na that they may have to engage in? They may have to engage in war. Do you see the difference between a goal and a task? Even if you don't like the context? Yes? This, by the way, makes a fabulous midterm exam question. We're asking you to define it and give me examples. So the goal is what are you trying to accomplish? The task is how do you get there? What steps do you take? Now, a lot of times you will see this type of thing in computer systems. Let's look at some examples. So, it's the programmer's task to put up barriers to protect data integrity. 
right? That's something you are going to deal a great deal with when you go out into the IT industry, whether you are a coder or a systems analyst. You ultimately, at some point, are going to have to deal with data integrity. But it's the user's goal to handle various needs of the client. So let me give you a quick example. So let's say you are designing a product for a company that ships things out of a warehouse. Well, one of the things that the employer tells you is, well, you know, we want to make sure that we don't ship anything out unless it's paid for and the whole order and the order is processed and we have an address and we know where it's going and all that fun and exciting stuff. So what the programmer does is they say, okay, I'm going to make sure that we will not accept an order unless it has all this required information, right? Payment, the address it's going to be shipped to, the billing address, right? Meets the goals of the, of the uh, programmer and what the employer said. Except now here comes someone who's a customer support rep, right? The company's having this fabulous sale. It's only a one-day sale. A customer calls. They have multiple locations, and they say, I want to take advantage of the sale. I want to place the order. I don't know which of my stores need the, the inventory right now, but I want to place the order to get the price, and then I'll find out where to ship it and give it to you. So the customer support person goes, and they try to put in this order, and what does the system do? Error, reject. Uh-oh, now what? How is this problematic? The customer who's ordering it doesn't get their great sale price. Lack of efficiency. And you may very well lose customers. Why? Because what was the programmer focused on? The data integrity. These are the requirements that they told me they need. They weren't thinking about how it may actually be used by the user. It happens all the time. It doesn't mean that the developer is dumb or anything like that. It's what they were focused on, having these requirements. So you want to remember, we need to focus on the user goals. And a lot of times, even as technology changes, the user goals don't. A company will want to be able to efficiently process orders. That's still going to be their goal. <clears throat> so with the goal-directed design process, you basically are using these various techniques that help you gather information about your users, things like ethnography, stakeholder interviews, market research, detailed user models, scenario-based design, of course, set of interaction principles that we will be talking about some of these specifics later in the, in the semester. And you are applying those starting at the beginning of the product development process. It's not just a visual facelift. It is integrated into the actual design. It helps provide a true product definition that is based on user goals, business needs, and technological constraints. And here's another thing that is really important that we actually will be talking about more when we talk about personas after the midterm. It helps bring empathy for the users to the process. Now you may say, why does that matter? Because empathy is something that will cause us to think more about who our users are and what they need. We want to make sure that the users are involved in the product research. We want to know who our users are. 